I'm Billy Zioli. Welcome to Film Forum. Here, any issue can be raised, any question asked. Today's subject, Deceive Two. Seven tests to protect you and your family against deception. Today's guest is Dr. Mel White. His film, Deceived, describing the Jonestown tragedy, has been seen in tens of thousands of churches and on television around the world. Dr. White, a filmmaker, author, former pastor, and seminary professor, speaks frankly of Jonestown and the lessons we can still learn. I love to snorkel. That is, put on a bathing suit and a mask and a snorkel and lie on your stomach looking down at the fishies. Any aficionados here? Good. I have to tell you a story before this begins, and it does relate. I was in St. Croix and on a boat on the way to an underwater national park, and the guide dive master said, I want to tell you about Barracuda. I don't know if you know about Barracuda, but I had never heard about a Barracuda. Did you know that Barracuda can unhinge their jaws so they can take in prey bigger than their mouths? It's a wonderful quality to have. <laughs> I didn't, as he said, think I would ever see one, however. But being the first into the water, I jumped off backwards, in, and when the bubbles cleared up, I was staring into the eyes of about a six-foot-long barracuda, who was, believe me, I know I'm the only one who saw it, but it's true, unhinging his jaw. <laughs> And I knew at that moment that I was about to get really into the Jonah story, you know? <laughs> and I started to swim backwards. I don't know if you've ever tried that with fins on. They, you, you, you know, you feel very graceful, like a rock. And the barracuda was doing his thing closer and closer around it. Black eyes, jaw unhinging. All of a sudden, I saw over my shoulder a ladder down into the water, and you'd have been proud of me. With one <clears throat> muscular pull, I was right up into somebody else's boat. Okay? About five macho types were drinking beer and eating sandwiches. And I said bravely, there, 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 there. There's a huge fish down there. And with that, all five put on their masks and jumped into the water and left me with the half-drunk beer bottles and the sandwiches. Now, what I learned later was that barracudas are also creatures of habit. And this was a domesticated barracuda they called Charlie. Somebody yelled, Charlie's back when they jumped in, that they feed sandwiches to. He was unlocking his jaw to get a tuna fish sandwich. <laughs> and so there I sat in the boat, feeling, uh, number one, how? Stupid, really stupid. What I had just about been killed by was tamed. What was about to be the end of my life had been conquered by a tuna fish sandwich. It's, a, it's an embarrassment, but it's also very relevant to the point I need to make tonight. To talk about deception and Jones and Jonestown is scary stuff. People want to avoid it at all costs. We want that whole thing swept under the rug. But the Christian believer really believes that death has been conquered, that the sting has been removed. It's still bad, but it's not something we need to fear. Is that right? Good. Then we mustn't be afraid to begin this forum where my film Deceived ended. Jones and Jonestown may be years past, but the lessons we have learned about deception and death must not be lost. Millions of our brothers and sisters are being deceived today. Do you remember this bright young victim of deception from the ending of Deceived? To forget her story and the others is to see it all happen again. Jan taught social studies to the 219 children murdered in Jonestown. When asked why his daughter went to Guyana, her father answered, she wanted to do something. She didn't like the world the way it was. And to tell you the truth, I admire for it. And she did something, and unfortunately it turned out to be the ghastliest mistake ever made. Lou Gervich was in Guyana, struggling to make contact with his daughter, when word of death in Jonestown reached him. 
he begged helicopter crews to let him fly with them to the scene, hoping his daughter would not be among the dead, hoping it was not too late to rescue her. And I asked the soldier where the bodies were, and he pointed, and it was about, I guess, 200 yards. And then from the pleasant atmosphere that you had felt from the air about Jonestown, it turned into a charnel house. And then, I guess it was the worst thing ever happened to me, and they had a casualty list. It's five pages long. And my daughter wasn't on the first four pages. She was on the fifth. I swear to God, I just can't get out of it. We must not forget Jonestown and the lessons we have learned. Jones was a small-time operator in comparison to the deceivers at work in our world today. Jesus warned us, quote, False Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders so as if to lead astray, if possible, even the very elect. Unquote. Jonestown is our chance to see and remember how it happened, how it happens to our brothers and sisters, and how we can keep it from happening again and again. The second story happened 2,000 years before that when Jesus was about to be crucified himself and he said to his disciples, this is the new commandment I give you, that you what? Love to love one another. Those two stories relate to the story we're about to tell. November 17, 1978. I don't know if you remember the moment when you heard the first rumors coming out of Jonestown. How many of you remember the first time you heard? Okay. Some kind of headline, some kind of news flash that 20 bodies in the Ryan party and then maybe 50 bodies in suicide, and then maybe 100. Do you remember those moments? And then all of a sudden we're talking about 400 and 500. About the fourth day out, the LA Times had a headline that said, Christian Church murders and then commits suicide in the jungle. Well, being a theologically inclined filmmaker, I immediately flew to Berkeley to visit the Freedom Center where the survivors and the defectors and the parents and children concerned hung out. Those are the people who were fighting Jones tooth and toenail, okay? That's the first time I had gotten into the cultic or into Jones at all. When I got there, the Human Freedom Center was surrounded by a SWAT team, the FBI, the Berkeley Police, the National Guard. There were news teams from all the majors, CBS, NBC, ABC, Radio Diffusion, from around the world, BBC was there. And the curtains were drawn, the doors were locked, and inside were the people that the outside forces wanted to talk to, but there was no communications going on. So I went through the crowd like some kind of a dummy, and went up on the door and knocked. <laughs> and I felt like everybody was watching to see if I had any better luck than they had had. And the door opened a crack, and you could see the chains, and they said, what do you want? And I said, my name is Mel White, I'm a filmmaker, I teach in a theological seminary, and I'm a churchman, and I'm... At that moment, they unlatched the chain, literally pulled me into the room, closed the door, and locked it again, and left me standing. The first thing we have to remember about deception is what its costs are. That was the first time I saw it with my own life. There were about 17 rooms in this huge four-story house. And in every room there was at least one television and around every television set there was at least eight or ten people. There were hundreds of people in the house. And I stood there for at least 20 minutes before I was talked to again and all I could see was as the news came on with another list of bodies a whole group of people crying, moaning and comforting each other as they found my family has been lost. My friends have been lost. My loved ones have been lost. Whether it's Hitler ranting and raving and deceiving and taking millions to their death, or it's a penny ante operator like Jones ranting and raving and deceiving, we must not forget 
the price of deception is inevitably death of one kind or the other. And so, you know, I suddenly realized this is not a commune, this is not a church, this is just insanity. We talked it over with our children, explained to them that we were going to be quitting the church, and they said, well, Mom and Dad, we love you very much, and we just hope that when you do decide to quit the church, you move far away so we aren't the ones assigned to kill you. And these two girls were 16 at the time. And this is how thoroughly brainwashed we were. So that's, that's the commitment that we all made when we finally decided to leave, that okay, we'll be killed for this, we'll probably be shot in the middle of the night or bombed or something, but it's better than going back. What you've just seen is Jeannie Mills predicting her own death. During my interviews, Jeannie Mills said, when we left Jones, we knew we'd probably be killed for this. And six months later, when our film was finished, Jeannie and Al and their daughter, Daphine, were all murdered in the very rooms where I interviewed them over those long months. I called the district attorney of Berkeley, and I called the investigating homicide officer before I made this taping tonight to get any more news. For two and a half years now, the crime has gone unsolved. It's still on the unsolved books, and they say it will probably be unsolved forever. Now, I love Jeannie Mills, and I loved Al Mills, and their daughter, Daphine. And they risk their lives by talking to me and telling the whole story, knowing that in so doing, they would take a tremendous risk. Secondly, we must remember who was deceived. That's what happened in that house. I didn't know why I was in and why all these big shots from all these big networks were left out. Then I found out. They said, Tim Stone will see you now. Tim Stone was a former district attorney of San Francisco. Tim Stone had been Jones' legal advisor and right-hand man for all those seven years. He had set up all the foreign bank accounts. He's quite a guy. I went into this room where he was waiting. They all wanted interviews. The networks were, would be paying him big money for an interview. He would talk to me. And I said, why? He said, Mel, I grew up in a G-A-R-B Baptist church. I graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Stanford. I was a student body officer at Wheaton College, and I was teaching at Berkeley Presbyterian Church when I joined up with Jones. He said, what you guys out there are forgetting is that most of the victims of Jim Jones and of the cults across this country are church people. And the networks are burying it in the bodies and the rumors about kill teams and the rumors about Jim Jones being a communist dupe. They don't realize that they're doing us a terrible disservice. That's why we won't talk to them. What you have to do is tell the story that it's church people who get locked into these cults almost 98% of the time. It's a second lesson we've got to learn from Jonestown and that we keep forgetting it, that we are the deceived ones. We are the ones who are setting each other up for deception. Why? Why did they leave the churches, the orthodox churches of our background and our families, right? Isn't that what you'd ask? There are two reasons. Inevitably, the interviews led to two reasons. One, they felt no love in their churches. They felt, have you ever gone to a new church? Have, have you ever gone through the door? Maybe you get said hello to by a boutonniere, right? Welcome. <laughs> That's it for the welcome. Breaking into a Christian church and into the clique that is the inside group of that church is one of the hardest things to, to do. They felt this from every church they joined, and that's why they went to Jones. Let me tell you what they felt in Jones Church. When they first went in the door, there were 50 members of the planning council. These are the top executives of this church with about 3,000 members waiting. And everybody who was new would be known. And there would be three of that planning council take you into a little room, separate you from your family, so that everybody was interviewed by three leaders of the church, and they'd sit you down and they'd give you coffee and donuts and, and set you up in, in, in a way that would say, we, the singing's going to be going on for a while. You're not going to miss a thing. All we want is you to know that we care about you and that we want desperately to help you. What are your needs? Well, they were in the Tenderloin District of San Francisco, so most of the people were poor or unemployed and in need. They had so many activities going that they could give you a job interview before the service was over. 
so that by the end of the service that you said you needed a job, you would be talking to your employer about what time you needed to go to work on Monday morning. Or, if you needed money, you would have a, a bank draft. Or, if you needed a house, they had houses all over the city that were empty, or dorms for college students to live in, or old people, or, or drug rehabilitation centers. I'll go through the list of things they were doing a little later. But they were all ready for the visitor. Okay? Now, you're still in being interviewed, right? And you're being loved. You are feeling love. Boy, are you feeling it. What, what happens next? Then they take you into the church and they, they present you to a family who's all prepared to take you in. I mean they take you into the pew. The little child from the family comes and sits in your lap and says, how glad we are to have you. The mother leans over in San Francisco and says, we want you to come to our house for dinner this afternoon where we only have chicken and, and corn and some pumpkin pie, but what we have, we'd love to have you come. Could you come? You know, imagine that in any of our churches. You know, we'd love you to have you come to dinner. What are you doing next year? Now, you go home with the family to dinner, and then in the mail, during the next five days, by Friday, you get 100 pieces of mail from individual members of the church, all handwritten, all telling you how much they have enjoyed the church and how much they're grateful that you had come to be with them. Okay? And by Wednesday, they would receive in the mail a five-pound box of chocolates. This is only a two-and-a-half-pound box because I couldn't afford the prop. <laughs> but they'd receive this with a little note from Jim Jones that usually said something like, you brought a little sweetness into our life when you visited our church. We wanted to bring a little sweetness into yours. Now, why don't you open this and share it around as we're talking? Um, because if I go home with that, I'm a dead man. <laughs> but now let me ask you, what church are you going to go to next Sunday? Huh? Okay. They needed love, and Jim Jones created an environment of incredible loving. Throughout this session, I will be interrupting with a series of tests that are designed to help you determine how likely you are to be deceived. Yes answers point to danger spots. Beware. Test number one on feeling loved. Are you feeling lonely and unloved? Are you afraid that people don't love you as you really are? Have you recently been rejected by someone you love? Do the people you care about ignore you? Remember, yes answers point to danger spots. And the other reason they went with Jones instead of with us is they needed a place to love others. They wanted desperately to be a redemptive force in their community. This is what Jim Jones and his crowd was doing. Jesse Jackson said, we mustn't forget the good they were doing in our attempt to understand the bad. And he's right. Look at what they were doing. They had a drug rehabilitation center. They had legal aid with sometimes as many as five Phi Beta Kappa law graduates giving free legal counsel to people who need it in that area. They had counseling for ex-prisoners and for ex-JDs. They had job placement centers. They had a free medical test for free pap smears and venereal disease tests. They had homes for the retarded. They had a communication center. They had a kitchen feeding 800 to 1,800 people every day, free in that neighborhood. They had college dorms. They had practical cutting-edge hope. This is the form that you had to fill out every week. This is a report of my visit to a hungry or a lonely person during the week. Every person in the church, besides working in one of these agencies that the church sponsored, had to simply take on a hungry or a lonely person and visit him every week. And these were carefully processed, and the people who didn't turn them in were often questioned before the whole congregation as to why they had been so busy about their own needs during the week, they hadn't had enough time just to visit one hungry or lonely person. Will you stand up, please, and explain to us why? Can you imagine that in our church? there'd be mass exodus. <laughs> so they had this incredible opportunity to do good. Test number two on loving others. Do you feel useless at times? Do you long to make a difference to someone? Do you feel helpless to make things better in your community? Do you feel guilty about having so much and sharing so little? Now, the next problem is what? 
that the church was the most loving was the most deceiving. And the church that made them feel the most loved was the church that led them inevitably to their deaths. Is that a problem for you? It's a terrible problem for me. So what do we do? Go out and affect a loving church? You know, the people who wrote these letters, I've talked to them. They hated it. So we had to write 50 letters a week. It was miserable. We were in bondage one night every week. They had to work 24 hours just to keep up with this. Jones saw it as a discipline to keep working that hard. But they were already being deceived by the process. So what do we do? I'm going to suggest right now that there are five tests to see whether love is authentic or inauthentic. See how you feel about these five tests. The first thing that we need to test is the abuse of authority. Authority. The authority figures in our lives. Jones killed their faith in every other authority figure but himself. He didn't want them believing or trusting anybody else. And he did it very interestingly. He did it first by carefully screening the people who got into the church. Do you know if you had a PhD and you looked like you were there to look over Jones Church, like if I'd gone up to visit Jones and I'd said, how do you do, I'd just like to come in, I couldn't have gotten into the church on a Sunday morning. If I didn't meet the grid, I couldn't get in. They would take me away. They'd say, I'm sorry. They looked for people who were vulnerable, and our vulnerability, each of us, changes from year to year. Right now you might be feeling, you know, really tough. Then suddenly you graduate from college or from high school, and you're on your own, and you put a pack on, and you carry your suitcase, and you go to some college, and the cults find you in the airport or the bus station, and they're looking for you because you are at a vulnerable time. That suitcase says he's alone in the world. He shouldn't be. Or you're, you're doing fine with your wife and your family and your marriage, and suddenly your wife dies or your husband dies, and you've never filled out a, a bill before. Jones often, they'd look through the obituary notices in the paper, they would go up and say, we've heard about your tragedy, we, we thought maybe you need some help with just taking care of your bills. And a widow would say, oh yes, thank God, and would then tell the people about People's Temple and how much they'd helped as they started to work for the people there. So they looked for people whose authority figures were tenuous at best. Secondly, they used they used positive celebrity endorsements. All the time, Jim Jones was pictured by the Lieutenant Governor, Lieutenant Dimley, uh, or by Mrs. Carter, the President's wife. Jim Jones himself was the Chairman of the Mendocino County Grand Jury. He was appointed by the Mayor of San Francisco, the head of the Housing Commission. His wife was a nurse and the accrediting nurse for the hospitals of San Francisco. They were constantly su supported by celebrities, by politicians, and people who are looking for authority figures love to see us surrounded by celebrities. The third thing, they used, they used blistering attacks that were very convincing. How many of you heard the story about how Jim Jones threw the Bible down? Yeah, all, a lot of you have. And, and you would have said, if Jim Jones threw the Bible down in my presence, I would have said to him, forget this thing, I'm leaving, right? Okay, now his audience is 75% black, 25% white. He says, open your Bibles. Whose name do you see in it first? King James, they all shouted back. See, let me tell you about King James. King James was the worst slave owner of his entire epic and would tell the stories of how King James treated his slaves. And say, you know where this Bible was? This Bible was up in the slave trader ships in the captain's cabin that brought your ancestors to this country and away from theirs. Then in the antebellum mansions of the south, where your people were herded into little cabins down by the river and kept in enslavement, this Bible was in a place of honor in those mansions. What we need to do, he'd say, is get rid of King James and release Jesus to be what he wants to be in your life and in mine. Now that's a little different, isn't it? From simply throwing, excuse me. <laughs> that was only a demonstration. <coughs> but it is a tragic demonstration because you can see how convincing he can be with these blistering attacks. Okay, all over this country now, we're looking for the celebrity authority figure to trust. We, we do very little to trust our own judgments about things. We have to help train each other to ask the hard questions or this abuse of authority will go on and on. Authentic love says, test me. Authentic love says, confront me. Authentic love says, listen to me until you think I'm phony and then check it. 
Authentic love says, I want you to have power over your life. I don't want to have power over your life. That's the difference. The, the abuse of authority. Test number three on authority figures. Do you believe there must be right or wrong answers for most questions? Do you feel more secure when someone is telling you what to do? Are you afraid to make important people angry because you disagree with them? Do you often mistrust your own ideas or responses? The abuse of time test. This is what he did primarily. They spent time in worship and in study. They spent time in service and evangelism, and they spent time in church management and upkeep, okay? That took 60 or 70 hours a week of every member in the church, okay? 60 or 70 hours. And they were doing good almost all the time. I mean, these aren't people who are doing bad in the community. They were exhausting themselves doing good in the community. I read that list. Okay, but what happened when you get so tired that you can't think? You get ready for the deceiver to come in and tell you anything he wants to tell you. And all you want to do is get some sleep and you'll just nod until he goes away. Authentic love says, I want you rested. Authentic love says, we know that you're going to be deceived if you're too tired to listen. The time test. That seems to me a very important one. When I, when, do you remember growing up in your local home church? My family, all I remember is my family being tired. My dad coming back from a trustee meeting, my mom coming back from choir practice, me coming back from the youth meeting, everybody shaking hands in the kitchen, and then falling fast asleep. You know, what were we doing to build family life? We were destroying each other and keeping each other exhausted. Time test. Do you feel guilty about taking time for yourself? Are you so busy that you have no time to do what is really important to you? Are you too tired to trust your own reactions? Does your whole sense of worth come from accomplishments and praise? The money test, and this is a spooky one. Jim Jones was not wrong to ask that they give their money to the poor. He used biblical verses at every point, by the way. He used Acts to say, we need it. They were wrong in not finding out that it was going to where they thought it was. The money test. Also, he said things like this. You can't outgive God. Now, we believe that, and yet it's not true at all. Because he said it this way. If you put $10 in the offering tonight, only it was 100 or 1,000, tomorrow in your mailbox you'll have $20. 200, 2,000. Okay? They even set it up where they would mail money to people in the church who would then get up and testify. And he's right. Yesterday I got two, it was $22, he said 20, but it came from a source I never knew. In fact, it's anonymous. Well, of course it was anonymous. These money appeals that are constantly into guilt, you cannot give God, but you better try. <laughs> you know, or fear. You have something left that you're holding back? You know who got out of the cult, who was rescued, who, who escaped Jones, were the people who held back a little bit of their own financial resources. Tim Stone got out of Jonestown because he kept an American Express card up to date and he never told Jones, though he was his financial and legal advisor. And one day when he saw what was happening, he stole a truck, drove to Georgetown, bought a ticket on the first plane out of Georgetown that happened to be going to London, and escaped with his life. By saving back just a little, it was the people who gave it all who died. The abuse of money test. That's a hard one to talk about. I, I, I mean, I know. But we need to talk about it. If, for example, you get asked on a, a religious radio or television program to send in money and you do it, and you don't ask for a financial accounting, you're being cultic. Because we have to keep each other honest, too. What's the least attended meeting in the church year? The business meeting. Why? And then when we go, we go rippity, 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 rip through the budget, right? Whereas, in fact, what is the only document that says the priorities of our local church? It's the budget. We don't understand it. We go ripping through it. The fact is, we're setting each other up for a Jim Jones who doesn't want you to see it. Doesn't want you to read through it. 
Do you give money out of guilt? Do you give primarily to win God's approval or your church's acceptance? Is your income inadequate to meet your basic needs? Are you sure that God will prosper you if you give generously? The abuse of discipline test. I talked to Jeannie Mills' daughter who was beaten 75 times in front of the entire church by a board just like this. This was their beating board. Beaten until her buttocks and, and her back were bleeding and raw in front of the whole church. What? What? And I said, why? He had discovered, she said, that I had sampled marijuana. And we did not use drugs in that church. And when he beat me, I said, what did you, how did you feel? I knew somebody at last loved me enough to get the message through my head. What? And she still means it. And she says, I haven't tried any drugs since that day. Well, the abuse of discipline. There is no church discipline in, at work in most of our churches now. I couldn't solve that. We all come from different traditions. But right now, if there's somebody in trouble, we all kind of wait until the worst of the rumors are confirmed and the people go down the drain. How do we work at church discipline? How do we help somebody who is floundering and in tremendous need? We can't even be honest to each other. When we have an inner sore that's just festering away, a problem with sexuality, a problem with money, a problem with marriage, where do we go? We're afraid. We've got to keep that religious mask on. And if we keep the mask on and everybody's smiling and happy, then everything's okay at the church. I've pastored. I know one whole church. I'll never forget the first time I sat at a funeral at my church and watched, after about two years of pastoring, everybody go by the casket one at a time. And I realized as I watched each one how much I knew and how much everyone hurt. Discipline. At least we need some place we can go and be counseled without fear of our story being told at a prayer meeting under the guise of a prayer request. We need somewhere to go where we can be honest with each other and discipline each other. You need a friend who will say, Mel, what you've just told me is going to wreck you, and I'm not going to put up with it. Now lean over. <laughs> <laughs> the abuse of discipline. He took it too far, but folks, he taught us a lot about a church that needed it desperately and enjoyed and appreciated it till it got out of hand. Do you feel that your life is out of control? Would a clear list of rules help you lead a better life? Is there no one with whom you can share your failures? Do you often feel guilty yet have no way to relieve that guilt? The last one, the abuse of intimacy. Jones destroyed all the intimate relationships in the church except between Jones and the people. He wanted marriages destroyed. He, he sent wives to one work and husbands to another. He wanted them dependent. He could not let them be intimate with each other because once they started raising doubts, what would happen? The rumors could spread. Each one of them told me how long it took. Most of them it took years before they would say, I think something's crazy in this church. Because it was all, report, you know, it was all reported me to Jones. So the intimacy out of which would come the kind of honesty, out of which would come the kind of solutions and getting away from Jonestown before it was too late, there was no way to be intimate. Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book, Life Together, please read that because he talks about sin wants us isolated and alone. Keep your secret. It's just what the evil one wants. It, it is. The abuse of intimacy. Oh, how he destroyed relationships. He kept people cut off by time. They were too tired to talk. He kept people cut off because they, intellectually they were isolated. He had one library in Jonestown and it was in his room. Nobody, but he would read the newspapers to them and explain them. Intimacy and that whole business of the abuse of intimacy. H how many friends do you have where you can say to them something that's really of the most honest nature? Do you have any? 
what are you doing to maintain those friends? When I look around some of my friends in this room, I think about how little time we really spend with each other. Intimately, now we, we eat dinners and we, we go sailing and we do different things, but those intimate times, how much do we spend? It might mean our life later on. Do you seldom have time for your family? Do you have no one in whom you can confide? Do you feel as if no one really understands you? Are you afraid that anyone who really sees you as you are will reject you? Okay, those tests, those different tests are very strategic. Now, one last thing, and then we're going to go down to you with questions. While I was in that Human Freedom Center that day, learning about the lessons that I needed to learn and meeting these people, there was another knock on the door. And they opened it a crack, and there was this guy with a Massey Ferguson cap, and sunburned arms from this part down and he said we heard you folks were in real need for food and clothing I'm from the Cabrillo Assembly of God Church and and we brought a half ton pickup filled with food I wonder if it could help and the, the place just got still as a, as a mouse people started looking for the door they stood there in silence for a long beat. And then Jeannie Mills went over and opened the door, and the people filed out until they made a whole line. You know, while all the networks are watching on, nobody's filming. And this isn't newsworthy, but you have 50 people whose relatives have all died in Jonestown carrying food from the little Cabrillo Assembly of God Church. And their eyes are filled with tears, and Jeannie Mills turns to me and says as we're watching this, maybe this time the church will come through for us. And Jesus said, by this will all men know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. That's the cure for the cultic. When we start to love each other, there's no cult figure in the land that can move in on us. But until we do, we are the most gullible people in the world. You are my sister Even though I hardly know you You are my brother Even when I do not show you to respond let's get that mic three years ago I came out of the Herbert W Armstrong cult right now my wife and I are, are faced with the fact that part of our family is still in that cult we love our families but they won't listen to what we have to say they're told and they're taught that we are deceived and that we're going to try to lead them astray and so they won't listen to what we have to say they won't that's true no how do we do we just, are, are we, I guess we're just persistent, are we not? And, uh, There's only one way to get people out of the cult. And you know, Jones is penny ante. I mean, we're talking about tens of millions of people today in various kinds of cultic groups. There's only one way to get people out. You cannot argue them out. You cannot give them reasons and books. You cannot give them guilt. There is no way for people to leave the cults until the cult finally does something that's offensive to them then they turn and leave. And then they go to the people who consistently loved and didn't judge them. The Mills kept giving medical cards so they could get free medical treatment to their kids who were still in the cult. 
The mills kept saying, you can use our food, you can use our money, you need anything you need. As, and the kids hated him at that time. And yet one day, when the kids wanted out, they went to the one place that didn't judge him. And I would think for you, it would be the hardest thing in the world not to want to you know, not to want to just keep working at it, working at it. Just keep loving, 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 and one day when the cult offends them, then they go. I'm wondering, what, what was going on with Jones? It seems like he became obsessed with a authority figure or something like that. What, what transformed his mind to become so powerful? What we've got to remember is that Jim Jones started as a very orthodox, evangelical, socially active Christian. I have heard literally dozens of his taped sermons. He was really into exegesis. He really studied the word carefully. This is a man who, who was given awards by the Council of Churches in back east for, for integrating a city. This is a man who was really loved and honored by the works that he did. What happened along the way is the mystery that we won't ever unravel. But what happens to any power broker when he's cut off from anybody who will tell him he's, you know, he, he's, he's off track? What, what happens to any power broker who is so exhausted himself? Jim Jones never spent any of that money on himself, by the way. He, he didn't cheat the people in that regard. And he didn't cheat them in time. He was always there when they had a meeting. In fact, he was injected with speed for seven years to keep him going. And so apparently, according to the medical community, that fried his brain in many ways. So there were so many things. And then the pressure going, and then feeling caught and trapped and cut off down there. And then being with the poor from... Those poor people would rather die in the jungle and go back to San Francisco. That was what was so hard for me to take. They lived in my town here in Los Angeles and the temple in San Francisco. And they would rather die in the jungle with Jones than go back to the kind of city they lived in. That's, that's pathetic. But that's another indictment against us, it seems to me. So I don't know the answer to that. And I think that solving it would even be a problem because we've got to watch it happening in all of us. I'm wondering why there was such a high percentage of black people that died in the Jonestown Massacre. 75% is very high. They were in the Tenderloin District of San Francisco, which is predominantly black. And Jim Jones was ministering primarily to people who were deeply in need in that part of the city. And therefore, the people who were really appealed to were the people who had those needs. And he was surrounded by a black neighborhood. Also, the 25% were white, were often, often social action people. People who really needed workers for the causes. So they combined the, often the black workforce and the social action people got together and made it work. And we realized afterwards that it was a very racist church and that there were no blacks on the planning council. There were no blacks in places of leadership. The blacks were almost left out entirely. They were really relegated to slavery. Jones didn't have any blacks around in the top levels. So that, in fact, they were really not noticing the clues. The only one who escaped, though, from Jonestown, you know, and led that group of people out was a black man who immediately went into Jonestown. When they took his passport away, he said, something's wrong. They took everybody else's passport away. They said, well, we can get it back when we want it. He said, well, then how can I have it now? And they took all his money. He said, something's wrong. Then he went to the cafeteria in Jonestown, and there was lousy food, and had been told how wonderful it is. I have wonderful brochures to show how they advertise to people to come to Jonestown. He kept saying, something's wrong, something's wrong, something's wrong. Then he started working with Jones people, and they had loudspeakers doing Jones sermons all day long. And he asked for a place out in the jungle to cut down trees so he wouldn't have to hear it. So he went out, and he kept thinking out there, chopping down trees. He said, something's wrong. We're going on a picnic. So he got 17 people who went on a picnic with him. They were ready to go on a picnic. When Ryan came, they said, today is our day for a picnic. He got them on a picnic. They all thought they were going on a picnic. And he said to them, we're not going back. And a lot of them protested. And he just yelled them into submission. And they started walking, not towards the jungle airstrip where Ryan's party was murdered, but the other way, the long way around Matthews Ridge. And those 17 people walked for three days and didn't even know about the massacre. But one person said, something's wrong here, and I'm getting out, and I'm getting out with my friends. He listened to the clues. Okay, thank you for coming to the forum. When we're through here, we know that you will be anxious to get together in little groups and talk over what I've said, too, and confront me and confront each other. Uh, I hope that out of your discussion will come answers to the problems that we didn't solve tonight. Thanks for coming to the forum. Even though I hide
hardly know you You are my brother Even when I do not show you Your 